Where is our culture going today? Indeed, is it going anywhere at all? A recent article by the Chief Rabbi of Great Britain, Dr. Jonathan Sachs, put it like this. He said, when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, God was going with them and giving them instructions. He said it was rather like having a GPS system in a car, which says to you, you need to turn right in half a mile from now. And of course, that leaves you open to the possibility that you might actually turn left instead out of sheer cussedness. And if you do that, the system will then wait for a minute and say, hmm, wasn't what we had in mind, but now that you've done that, you're now going to have to do this and then that and then the other to get back on track. And Jonathan Sachs said, that's what it was like when the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness. God went with them, but said, well, I didn't have that turn in mind, and now you're going to have to do this and this and this. And maybe our culture is like that, with God somehow grieving along with us and giving us instructions and so on. But then Jonathan Sachs went on to say, there is another option, and it's not so attractive. There is a type of ant which, when it gets lost, is programmed to follow the ant in front. Now that normally works out all right because somewhere out there there's some little legged creature that knows where it's going. But sometimes the ants like that get themselves into a huge great circle where each one is following the ant in front all right, but they're all joined up again at the back going round and round and round and they all die because they don't know how to get out of that pattern. And the question really is, is our culture like that? Are we just going round and round in circles and getting nowhere? And it's because of that that we find again and again that certain themes bubble up in popular consciousness, themes which actually have haunted the imagination of the human race from very early on. And if you look at ancient poetry, whether it's from Egypt or Greece or wherever, ancient Chinese philosophy, or if you go to quite other parts of the world and study cultures and the artifacts they make, again and again you find these four themes. And it's because I've been fascinated by those four themes for a long time and I'm very interested by the way in which they play out in relation to the Christian tradition that I began this book, Simply Christian, with a consideration of these four themes and of the puzzles that they leave for us. And then I develop the book as it goes on with an attempt at showing how the Christian story relates to and answers and develops these four themes. Briefly, the four themes go like this. The first is what we can call justice. Basically, we know that there is such a thing as getting it right, as something being fair, or, on the other hand, as something being got wrong, as something being unjust and unfair. You don't have to teach people that. A child in the school playground will say, that's not fair. And they will know precisely what it means and what it would take to put whatever it's happened, uh, to put that right. And so we are left with this thought that, yes, we all know that there is such a thing as justice, as getting it right, as fairness, and yet we're not very good at it. We have whole systems for it. When I lived in London, I lived down the street from the Houses of Parliament and from the head of the police and from the great centre of, uh, of all the legal enterprises that go on. We had masses of justice institutes, if you like, and yet justice still slips through our fingers. You can't quite get your handle on it and make sure that it's all going to work as it should. And so there's a puzzle about that, a puzzle for us in our larger systems and a puzzle in our own lives, because though we want justice when we have been wronged, we don't always want to give justice when we have actually wronged someone else. So that's the first of the puzzles. And the second goes like this. 
There used to be a time, maybe 40 or 50 years ago, when those who were leading in our culture were saying that religion and spirituality and prayer and all that sort of thing was really something that at best was a concern for people in their private individual lives. And it wasn't actually something that they needed uh, to worry about in public life or in real life or to get them going as genuine human beings. It was kind of a, a private hobby for people who liked that sort of thing. But in the last 10 or 15 years, spirituality has been making a comeback. People are now actually hungry for spirituality. If you put on a lecture course saying, introduction to spirituality, a lot of people will come because people have started to realize that actually you can go as hard as you like in the pursuit of money, of sex, of fame, of happiness of all sorts. But actually there'll be an ache somewhere inside that says there's another bit of you that isn't being refreshed. There's another bit that needs to grow and develop to balance all these other bits. As a bishop, I go around doing, among many other things, uh, confirmation services. And often the confirmation candidates are quite young, but sometimes there are young adults and sometimes older adults who come forward for confirmation, which takes a certain amount of guts, in my culture at least, to stand up and be counted. And I often say to them, what are you doing here? Why are you standing up in front of your family and friends? And they say, well, it's because a while back, maybe I came to a funeral or something, a book I read or something just triggered a question in me. And I've been on that quest because I've realized there's something deep that is missing in my life and I need to go in search of it. And then I came into this church and the people were surprisingly friendly and I actually found that there was something there that I needed. And what they're talking about is that spiritual quest but spirituality too is a puzzle. Different people find different things help them at different times. I have known people who have been delighted to come into a church where people dance around in the aisles. And I've also known other people who have left the church because they, people have started doing that there. So spirituality isn't a one size fits all thing. It isn't here's a neat formula and this will solve all your problems. And actually the greatest saints who've gone more deeply into the life of prayer and spirituality than anyone else will come back and tell us that there are puzzles and yes, pains and problems and difficulties there which they have to wrestle with. And yet they say the quest draws us on. So there's justice and there's spirituality. But then as well, there is something which, again, you can't miss out there in popular culture and in here in our own hearts and lives and imaginations. And it's about relationships. We all know that we are made for one another. And yet we all know that relationships are remarkably difficult. I have just this afternoon come off the telephone to somebody who's had a relationship really fall apart and there was a confrontation and angry words were spoken and I've now spoken to both the people involved and they're puzzled as to how that happened and what went wrong and in particular what if anything can we now do about it and yet relationships aren't just something that you can say oh well easy come easy go I've been friends with this person and now I'm going to be friends with that person we all know that there is such a thing as loyalty as being true to a friendship a relationship to a marriage and yet it is difficult it's hard work and many of the greatest novels and plays and poems end with relationships in tatters and in disaster and even where a friendship or a marriage lasts a lifetime it still has to face this puzzle. What happens when one of those partners or both of them die? Death hovers over the whole question. Is life just a sick joke? Is it all just a bit of meaningless nonsense? So we have justice, which poses some questions. We have spirituality, which is very attractive, and yet it's not as easy as it sounds. And we have relationships, which we all know we need, and yet we're all very puzzled about. And then there's the fourth one. And this is perhaps the most evocative of all, beauty. We all know that some things just draw us out. We hear a tune and we think, oh, that is amazing. I'd love to hear it again. And if the composer's wise, he or she will bring it back a few minutes later for you, whether it's a song or a symphony or whatever. Or we look at a sunset. One of the great things about this house where we're filming is that there are wonderful views and when the sun goes down, it fills the valley with a sort of golden light and it's wonderful and beautiful. And then five, 10, 15 minutes later, it's dark. 
What's happened to the beauty? It's slipped through our fingers. And if we try and photograph it, what we get is a memory of the beauty and often not the real experience itself. And yet people inevitably paint pictures to try to capture the beauty, to try to point out that this is really a wonderful world we live in. And yet at the same time, there are many parts of the world which once were beautiful, but there's been a tidal wave, a tsunami, or an earthquake, or a volcano, and it's just reduced to rubble. And the people who live there who once celebrated that beauty are now just in tears and in despair. What is this world all about? So justice and spirituality and relationships and beauty leave us with awesome questions which are difficult to address and yet which all human beings from the quite young to the quite old, from east to west and north and south, they know in their bones that these are questions which you've got to wrestle with if you're going to be genuinely human. In part two of the book, I go into the big question, who is God anyway? I once went to the Holy Land with a wonderful man who'd been a, a high-flying businessman for much of his life and was coming to retirement and wanted to ask the deep questions. So he came on a pilgrimage with me and some others to the Holy Land. And the first night he sat us down and he said to me, now Tom, he said, there really was a Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, there really was a Jesus Christ. And he said, and he really did die on a cross. I said, yep, he really did die on a cross. He said, and he really did rise from the dead. And I said, yes, and we'll be talking about how we know that in a, in a few days time and then he paused and he said and who is God anyway and I said we're going to be talking about that for the next two weeks and we did and bless him by the time he got home he was ready to stand up in public and to say that he was now counting himself in as one of the Christian tribe if you like and he got confirmed as an old man but the question of who is God is one which is actually both easier and harder to deal with than many people imagine. Many people in our culture think it's just a total mystery that you can't possibly know anything really about God and it's your idea or my idea or somebody's idea down the street and we'll never really know. And actually the good news is there are ways in which you can get to grips with that question and can start really to, to know and to do business with the living God. So it isn't just a total mystery, but at the same time, many people in our culture think, oh, well, we know who God is. God is an old man with a white beard sitting upstairs on a cloud, looking down and sending thunderbolts against people he doesn't like or whatever. And when people come up with that stuff, I say to them, well, that's one meaning that some people have given to the word God. It certainly isn't what I believe about God. And then they look rather puzzled and think, hmm, this man's a bishop. Is he saying he's an atheist? He doesn't believe in God. I say, no, I believe in the God I see revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. And he's not like that God at all. And that puzzles people. Who is this God who is revealed in this man, Jesus, who lived and died 2,000 years ago and who we Christians believe rose again from the dead? And so you have to start telling stories about God. That's often the best way in. And some of those greatest stories are in the Bible, in the Jewish scriptures that we call the Old Testament. And the Old Testament tells a story about God, which isn't about a distant, remote, detached God who only has a kind of a long distance relationship with the world. But nor are they stories about a God who is all part of the world so that you just look at the divine forces within creation and that's all there is of God. They tell stories about a God who engages with the world, who interacts with the world, so that we find in the Old Testament that what they called heaven and what they called earth, God's space if you like and our space, actually overlap and interlock. And that's one of the central themes of this book. It's about how heaven and earth really do mesh with each other, do business with each other, and how that's always puzzling and frequently painful, but always creative, because that's where the life of God and the life of the world are coming together in power, in suffering, but always in hope. 
And so we move on in the section about who God is, not just talking about God and his ancient people, the Jews, and Jesus, who the Christians believe was the Jewish Messiah, but also about the Holy Spirit, the one who now breathes into the life of people and into the life of the world to give hope, to give new life. And so the third and final section of the book talks about what happens when that new life comes. And there are many things which Christians can say about the new life which God has given to the world in and through Jesus of Nazareth. But perhaps the first and most important thing is to say that when you really start to do business with God, you want to fall down and worship him. Well, people my age, my knees are a bit creaky, I'm not very good at falling down. But you know what I mean. We want actually to say, this God who we're getting to know is so great, so wonderful, so loving, so powerful, that the proper response, the ennobling response, if you like, is to adore him, is to worship him. Some people say, oh, a God who wants us to worship him all the time. He's like one of those old style dictators who wants lots of people down there to be applauding politely whenever he appears. God's not like that. Uh, one of the illustrations that I have used to get at this is that there have been some times in my life when I've been to a wonderful concert, say, when the music has been so fantastic, so breathtaking, so energizing, exciting, that when it stops, Everyone just automatically jumps to their feet rapturously, not one of those rather stale, tired standing ovations, but an instant one, electrifying, because this has been so wonderful, that's the only possible response. That's what Christian worship is supposed to be like. When you really see who God is, you want to worship him for all he's worth and to worship him with all that you've got. And out of that worship, everything else will grow and flow. The life of prayer, as we discover that as Christian people, we are called to be places where heaven and earth overlap, where we do business with God, which is scary and demanding and painful, but always deeply rewarding. And then, bit by bit, we'll discover more that we need to do business with God by reading the Bible. And so I have actually two chapters in this book about what the Bible is, how we can read it, how we can get the best out of it and avoid some of the pitfalls that people regularly get into when they're reading the Bible. But then, of course, way out beyond, there's a sense of a task. There's a sense of something new that God wants his people to do. Being a Christian is not simply about me and God getting it together. It isn't even about me and my friends and God getting it together. It's about what God wants to do for his world and wants to do through his people in and for his world. You see, when we go back to those four questions we started with, justice and spirituality and relationships and beauty. It isn't that we just leave them standing there and say, well, that's a neat way of getting into some of the questions about God. It's a matter of discovering that God cares passionately about justice, that God wants people to engage in a relationship with himself, and that out of that relationship, which we can call spirituality, if you like, all other human relationships can find ways of being put back on track, getting them right again, reconciliation, forgiveness, those sort of things can become a reality. And in particular, God wants his people to celebrate the beauty of creation and to do so by what the Bible calls the beauty of holiness, which is the beauty of a human life lived to the full, to the glory of God. We humans, you see, were called to bear God's image. And that isn't just reflecting God back to God, though it's that too. It's reflecting God out into God's world so that the world is to be given a chance at justice, at spirituality, at relationships, at beauty, by who we are and what we do. So the call of the Christian, and this is really where this book ends, is so to live lives of worship of this God, of prayer to this God, of learning who this God is through scripture and of how we can live for him, that our lives won't just be me getting saved and me going to heaven, but rather me and others like me working together in that costly fellowship we call the church to bring the life and love of God to bear on the world that still so badly needs it.
The reason I wrote this book really was because there's a lot of complicated ideas out there in the world, a lot of funny ideas about what Christianity is, and I wanted to try to get it down to what seemed to me the simplest and most basic statements that have to be made if we're to understand the Christian faith in today's world. That's why the book is called Simply Christian. It isn't about being a particular type of Christian, a Catholic Christian, a Protestant Christian, uh, a high church or low church or Orthodox or Western or whatever. It's about the stuff that pretty well all Christians hold in common. And it isn't a book for your academics, for people with PhDs to their name and so on, though I hope they'll enjoy it as well. It's a book for people who want to get the simple framework of what Christian truth is all about and of what Christian life could be all about. And my hope and my prayer is that this series, like this book, will enable you and anyone who watches this to be able to get to grips not only with what Christianity is, but ultimately with who God is really is.